my screen. Perfect. Uh, okay, great. Well, thanks a lot for that introduction, Paolo. Uh, as Paolo mentioned, uh, the work I'll be discussing relates to, to temporal networks and information cascades. Uh, the talk that I'll be presenting is based very closely on a paper that was recently published uh, under the same name as, under the same title as this talk. So Dynamics of Cascades on Burstiness Controlled Temporal Networks. So this was carried out while I was uh, a PhD at uh, ENS Lyon and subsequently a postdoc under the supervision of my PhD advisor, Martin Karshai, along with our collaborators, Gerardo Iniguez and James Gleason. And then now, as Paolo mentioned, I've recently taken up a postdoc with James at the University of Limerick in Ireland. So the way that I'll be progressing is somewhat in reverse to how the project unfolded. So initially, our group was interested in the analytic techniques. So what we call a master equation solution for binary state dynamics on networks. But as time went on, the phenomenology, so the Monte Carlo experiments that we were carrying out got more and more interesting and became perhaps the highlight of the work. And it's those experiments that I'll be walking you through today. So to give an introduction to burstiness, which is not limited to network systems and information diffusion, in general, it means to observe significantly enhanced activity levels over short periods of time, followed by long periods of inactivity. So this is a broad definition due to Go and Barabashi, which can be applied to a number of dynamical systems. So in the physical sciences, if we study earthquakes, we might, over a very long observation window, observe intervals in which no seismic activity is observed, so no tremors, but short windows where a large, number, a large amount of activity occur at a rate uh, that we wouldn't observe if the underlying process was random. Similarly, in studies of magnetization, we might apply an external field to a ferromagnet and observe long periods of inactivity where no response to the external field is observed, followed by short intervals where an avalanche or cascade of spin flips are, occur in the magnet. So it's in this spirit that in the study of human social systems, we look at the distribution of times between events. So in online interactions, for example, in mobile phone call systems, uh, interactions over email messages and what have you, we look at the distribution of times and observe that long intervals take place uh, where no activity occurs, followed by short intervals where we might see an avalanche of interactions and information diffusion. So all of these systems can be illustrated as follows. Uh, we'll assume that time is continuous and that the time between events is given by tau, the inter-event time. And that quantity follows the distribution psi shown on the right. So the first system I've shown corresponds to a Poisson process and events here arrive at a constant rate. So events corresponding to the vertical lines uh, in the time domain. And in a memoryless process like the Poisson process, what's induced is an exponential distribution of inter-event times. So if we go to large values of tau corresponding to long waiting times, these are exponentially suppressed. So in contrast, in a bursty system, these long waiting times are expected. And because we're comparing systems for equal mean, equal expected inter-event time, Compensating for these long waiting times are short burst, short intervals where bursts of activity occur. And clearly, long waiting times are dictated by the tail of the distribution, so large tau, which on a log log scale uh, look as follows. So an exponential distribution races to zero, suppressing large values of tau, where a heavy tail distribution corresponding to a bursty process might be linear over orders of magnitude if it's driven by a power law, for example. Uh, if it's a pure power law, that straight line will continue on a log-log plot. Uh, if it's eventually suppressed by an exponential cutoff, then it will go to zero, but not before producing long waiting times. So we contrast this to a 
a regular time series just for completeness where times between events are uniform corresponding to a delta function intervent time distribution. And we refer to these different cases by the standard deviation sigma tau. So an exponential distribution, if mean is one, will have sigma tau equal to one. A bursty system will have sigma tau greater than one and less than one for the regular case. So we classify bursty systems in this way uh, due to Laszlo Barabashi, who introduced, uh, among many other things, the burstiness parameter B, which takes the mean and standard deviation and maps them to the interval minus one to one. So minus one for a regular system and up to one for an arbitrarily bursty system. And the notion of burstiness has become, thanks to Laszlo, uh, increasingly popular. And that is partly due to the fact that as a concept is just so evocative. So when we are presented with these time series, we're invited to consider how we as individuals distribute our interactions in time and whether we do so in a bursty way. And part of the richness here is the fact that uh, burstiness is what we call an emergent phenomenon, meaning it's the final result of underlying complex interactions. And part of this complexity is due to causality and autocorrelation. So in a magnetic system, a spin realigning causes its neighbors to realign by virtue of uh, the, their interactions. And similarly, in a human social system, in a mobile phone call network, for example, one interaction may trigger others based on the contents of that call. So burstiness in general is a rich concept uh, with uh, quantities that won't necessarily be captured by the burstiness parameter, which is throwing away everything to do with autocorrelation, causality, and what have you. Uh, nevertheless, it's a useful phenomena, useful quantity that has driven a lot of the modeling in burstiness. For example, when we're fitting distributions to empirical data, we often use distributions from the two parameter family, parameterized by mean and standard deviation. So, what we're interested in this work is how information diffuses by means of these interactions. So if Alice is exposed to some information, how is she going to transmit that to Bob based on their interaction patterns? In the Poisson case, if transit transmission takes place with equal probability at each event, then this can actually be reduced to a static problem with some effective transition rate, transmission rate, so beta. So in a way that's completely solved and, and it can be handled analytically and computationally with no problem. What we're interested in is in the bursty case where no such static network mapping can be found. So the system's non-Markovian and analytically poses a ch challenge to the modeling. So between uh, long waiting times, no transmission can take place. But if Alice and Bob are undergoing a burst of communication, of course, that raises the likelihood of transmission. And it's that challenge from a modeling point of view that we'd like to overcome. So we're not just interested in pairs of individuals, but how they uh, collectively lead to uh, information transmission on a whole. So we can imagine that Alice and Bob are part of a broader social network. You can imagine that if they're interacting online in some in some online forum like Reddit, or if you take the Wall Street bet free, bets subreddit, for example, we can interpret the information in question as being something like um, one should invest in GameStop shares. And if that information propagates uh, collectively to a large proportion of the network, clearly that information diffusion process can have real world consequences. So this sets, it up, sets us up to the research problem. So we aim to explore the question of how bursty interaction patterns affect the diffusion of information over networks. So to answer this problem, we set up our temporal network model. So elements of this model exist in separate works, but we combine them in a way to compellingly address our question. So the first layer is the bursty temporal network itself. So this is made up of a static underlying network representing potential contacts. So everyone that we've connected with or have the potential to connect with in some online setting. And that's specified by its degree distribution PK. 
On top of each edge in the network, we define an event sequence representing uh, the time series of their interactions. We'll sample these inter-event times from a distribution psi. And since tau are, seems to be IID, meaning consecutive tau values are uncorrelated, uh, we've thrown away any notion of autocorrelation and causality and just concerning ourselves with the parameters of the Bursi parameter, so mean and standard deviation, in addition to the structure provided by psi. And the simplest stochastic process that meets these assumptions is what we call the renewal process. So the second layer of the model is what we call the memory kernel. And that is just a map on each edge from the renewal process to define a notion of interaction strength instantaneously. And the third layer is the information layer itself. So node dynamics. So we assume these are binary state, meaning nodes are either infected or uninfected with respect to some piece of information. If we assume the information flows like a disease or an epidemic, we will use an SI model. Or if uh, it's a behavioral model where individuals require reinforcement from multiple neighbors and multiple interactions, we might use a threshold model. For example, the Watts model adapted to this temporal network setting. And by way of contrast, we refer to this as complex contagion. So the three layers of the model are represented here. So node U has three underlying contacts, V1, V2, V3, whose renewal process time series are shown on the left. The second layer of the model is the memory kernel. So here it's the shaded interval. And this uses notions from what we call attention economy. And it's to say that because individuals in any network have finite capacities in terms of attention, but also cognitive capacity, memory, and time, the contribution of any single event to their decision-making in the long run is going to go to zero. And by extension, what that means instantaneously is that our notion of interaction strength is dictated by a finite memory window, which here we've called ATA. And in the simplest case, if the uniform, if the memory window is uniform, the interaction strength instantaneously is just the number of events within that window. So that would give U incidents interaction strengths of nine, zero, and three with its different neighbors. So having defined the memory kernel, it allows us to develop a notion of transmission and interaction strength. So the total influence incident upon node U is the sum across its neighbors. So nine plus zero plus three. And the active or infected influence, the subset of that influence due to infected neighbors. So here that would be three because node th uh, V3 is uh, infected. And there are a number of transmission mechanisms that we can define. So as mentioned, simple and complex contagion. Uh, what we'll just use for the bulk of this work is the simple contagion example. So here we assume that each event with each interaction with an infected neighbor increments the transmission rate by value lambda. So here at this snapshot, the, the transmission along node edge UV3 occurs at rate three lambda. So what our model looks like on a whole is as follows. In the Poisson case, meaning inter-event times are exponentially distributed, we can see that the fluctuations for various snapshots of the network uh, don't deviate too far from the mean. So we represent interaction strength by edge thickness. And as you would expect in a constant rate process like the Poisson, we don't have large bursts of activity or edges that are weakly interaction. So they're very close to the mean. In contrast, in a bursty system, necessarily edges in the network are undergoing bursts of activity, meaning a spike in the instantaneous interaction strengths. So more edges in the network are thick. Correspondingly, there are more edges that are in the non-interacting state because they're caught in a long waiting time between events. So hence the almost transparent edges in the bursty setting. And a few snapshots of the network at different times uh, is consistent. So we're at a steady state. So one thing to note, even at this point, is the difference in what we call component size distribution in the two cases. So a component is simply a set of nodes that we can 
reach by traversing edges. So under my cursor is a component of size four and the component size two. And just with a few snapshots, I hope I can convince you that the average component size is larger in the Poisson case. And we'll make use of this later. So the third layer of the model is the information diffusion layer. And we're going to assume that the information process itself is triggered by external influence. And that is to model information due not to network me mechanisms, but to something external to the network, like an individual creating some content or an outside influence sponsoring content and introducing information to the network in that way. We'll assume that because there's a cost associated with the creation or sponsoring of content, that it occurs at a very low background rate, uh, but is constant throughout the dynamics of the process. And what we'll be doing is studying the propagation of the infected state from the initial sources to a given fraction of the network. So onto the experiments themselves. Uh, what we're going to be doing is monitoring what we call row F. So the fraction of infections that are due to noise or external influence. If row F approaches one, because noise arrives at a very low background rate, the corresponding diffusion process must have been slow. And if row F approaches zero, that means noise triggered an avalanche. So external noise or the creation of information had a large has a large catalytic effect where the network does the job of propagating that information and the resulting process is fast we'll assume that intervent times are gamma distributed with mean one and we're going to smoothly vary sigma tau across sigma, uh, across successive experiments and for the bulk of the experiments at least in this presentation we're going to use the si model with the transmission constant lambda set to 0 0.05 and networks are of fixed size of 10 to the six and we fix the degree distribution. So the basic experiment is as follows. On the horizontal axis, we're smoothly varying sigma tau, which is our proxy for burstiness. And on the vertical axis, we're measuring row F, which is that fraction of nodes due to external influence. So as row approaches one, the process is no slow and noise reliant and approaching zero, the process is fast and noise had a catalytic effect leading to an avalanche of network induced the infections. And the basic result in this experiment is as follows. So the process is relatively fast in the Poisson case. So only one in a thousand approximately infections were due to external influence. The rest were propagated via network mechanisms. So SI process conveying the infected state among neighbors. But as burstiness increases, we have this decelerative effect. Over time, the process is getting slower and slower. And this is straightforwardly traced back to the role of inactive edges. So we've assumed that edges caught between long waiting times are clearly incapable of conveying the information. Although locally, a burst of activity between an uninfected and infected neighbor will always greatly increase the transition rate, that is balanced out by the non-interacting edges in the network. And that effect gets larger and larger the more we increase burstiness. So this result is fairly straightforward. What is more interesting by far is that when we compare intervent time distributions, even after controlling carefully for the burstiness parameters, so mean and standard deviation, we get drastically different results. So choosing another distribution from the two parameter family, so the log normal distribution, for example, and carefully controlling for the same parameterization, what we observe is that the process for any value of burstiness is drastically accelerated. So even taking a modest value of sigma tau equal to 20, the speed up is over an order of magnitude. So the diffusion process reaches some cutoff, some arbitrary cutoff over 10 times faster 
under a log normal case than the gamma case. So we weren't expecting them to be exactly the same, but we were expecting them to be relatively close because although burstiness as an emergent phenomena is due to underlying complex activity like autocorrelation between bursts and causality, We've thrown those out by using a renewal process. We're just keeping the information due to the burstiness parameter, mean and standard deviation. But despite that, there's something else going on. Information that we haven't thrown out that's stored in the intravent time distributions that is leading to uh, substantial differences. So in other words, the burstiness parameters, mean and standard deviation, are giving really shocking predictions of what the resultant dynamics look like. So to make sure this wasn't a fluke, we checked the, an, a third distribution from the same family of distributions. So the Vable distribution, also carefully controlling for mean and standard deviation, yet again, gives drastically different results. And by coincidence, it's just between the log normal and gamma case, giving this nice smooth uh, ribbon looking diagram. So that was very surprising. However, we know the cause of the decelerative effect. Although locally burstiness is accelerative, the cost of that is that edges enter a non-interacting state due to having drawn long waiting times between events. So what we do is take this data and control for the, num the fraction of edges in the network that are in a non-interacting state. If we call this parameter CE, so the fraction of edges that are non-interacting, and replot the data in the first experiment, all the, cur the three curves collapse onto the same, uh, the same curve in the second figure. So while sigma tau and mean tau are lousy predictors of resultant dynamics, the physical quantity of the fraction of non-interacting edges is itself an excellent predictor. But it still doesn't explain why these different distributions give a different value of CE. So we still have some explaining to do. So in summary, when we're in the bursty regime, uh, the resultant dynamics vary over orders of magnitude and the burstiness parameters are insufficient and we need to extend our characterization of burstiness. We're we have a first clue of what this might look like by having stumbled across this sparsity parameter CE. So I want to give a brief aside on a problem called edge percolation, which a number of you will be familiar with. And this is a branch of graph theory with many applications in network science and involves the problem of taking a fixed set of nodes and studying the distribution of cluster sizes as we add and remove edges from the network. So the earliest formulation that can be understood in terms of uh, edge percolation is the eddish renyi model, where we progressively add edges to the network in a random fashion and observe a phase transition in the size of the largest connected component. So if C is our probability of adding an edge between any two pair of nodes, which can be related to the average degree, then a value at A is below percolation, we say, meaning that on that the expected cluster size is, uh, is small. At the phase transition, we have B, and above percolation, we say, is C. So the number of edges related to the average degree is the horiz horizontal axis, and the giant component size is on the vertical axis. Below percolation, as I said, components are small and disconnected. Above percolation, uh, at percolation, sorry, at the continuous phase transition, uh, the variance in uh, cluster sizes is maximized. And uh, we start to see that the mean cluster size is increasing. And above percolation, we have what we call as a giant component. So a bulk of the network nodes that can be reached by traversing edges. So we'll see that this plays a key role in explaining the previous experiments. But before we see this come into play, we develop a heat map. So 
the horizontal axis is the same as before. So we're smoothly increasing uh, burst in us, so sigma tau. And the vertical axis is the memory length, which previously would just set to one. And so what we're going to focus on is this quadrant. So when the system is bursty, because we're interested in bursty dynamics, and for when memory is greater than one. And there are loads of arguments due to autocorrelation and stochastic processes where we can convince ourselves that this is an interesting regime to look at. So the value of the heat map is the same experimental parameter as before. So row F, the fraction of infections that were due to noise meaning the light colors were processes that were extremely slow. The network itself wasn't doing the job of mediating information. It was just waiting on these external infections, which were slow. And the fast region means the network itself was rapidly diffusing the information throughout the network. And what we see is the clearest feature of this region is this increasingly sharp phase separation between the slow and fast regime. We understood the smooth onset of the slow regime in the previous experiments by looking at the fraction of edges that was gradually increasing in the non-interacting state, but that's getting sharper and sharper as we increase our memory parameter eta. Because we know non-interacting edges are behind the decelerative effect of burstiness, what we do is look at this from an edge percolation point of view. And what we're gonna do in this heat map is look at the regions where the system is below percolation, meaning by looking at active edges in the temporal network, we can traverse from node to node. When a joint component exists, we're gonna plot that as being above percolation. And when it's below percolation, we'll plot that in a separate regime. And what we see is this edge percolation calculation really accurately predicts the phase separation. So above percolation, the spreading is rapid because the temporal network itself was connected. And below percolation, the diffusion process is slow because the network is broken down into small fragmented components where uh, information diffusion is inefficient. So it's nice that this is such a good predictor, even if a percolation problem wasn't so surprising, given that we've somewhat defined uh, an edge to be non-interacting if it hasn't recently observed an interaction. But what was surprising, if you remember from the previous experiment, is that different intravent time distributions give surprisingly different uh, diffusion outcomes. So the result I've shown is for the Vable distribution, if we add in the other distributions that we looked at, the gamma distribution shifts the phase transition uniformly in the sigma tau eta plane, and the log normal distribution shifts it in the opposite direction. So we can understand this in terms of the robustness of the giant component. As we increase burstiness for fixed values of memory, the giant component fragments most easily under the gamma distribution and is most robust under the log normal distribution. But what's clear from this picture, rather than the previous three curves that we saw a few slides ago, is that now it's clear that the difference is due to a single parameter. In other words, the angle produced by the phase transition in the sigma tau eta plane. And what this is inviting us to do is to look at three parameter distributions. So if Gamma, Vabel, and log normal are two dimensional. Perhaps introducing a third dimension to the distribution might account for this degree of freedom that we see in the phase separation. And searching through the literature uh, was the happy discovery that uh, the so called generalized gamma distribution exists. And by controlling two of its degrees of freedom by mean and standard deviation, and its third degree of freedom by some higher order quantity like skewness, then we can recover smoothly this variation in the phase separation. So if we call gamma tau the skewness, we can understand these results in terms of that variation. And we prove this in experiment. So instead of sampling from the two parameter distribution, 
we tune the three parameter distribution with a higher order quantity like skewness, then we can show that the onset of the phase separation smoothly varies as a function of that parameter. So the horizontal axis here is skewness gamma tau and the vertical axis, the critical value of burstiness required for us to see the decomposition or a collapse in the giant temporally connected component. And because the Weibel and gamma are at special cases of the generalized gamma distribution, we exactly recover that. And because the log normal distribution is a limiting case, we can hypothetically extrapolate to there, but not numerically just because of uh, the, the challenges that the numerics posed. That was for an arbitrary choice of memory eta, and we can repeat that experiment for different values of eta. So what do these actually look like? The intervent time distributions. So log normal distribution is familiar, uh, parameterized by the underlying mean and standard deviation of the corresponding normal distribution. The gamma distribution is made up of a power law component with an stretched exponential cutoff. The Weibull distribution, similar to the gamma, power law and an exponential cutoff component, except now the exponential is wrapped in the power law parameter. And the generalized gamma looks like the Weibull, except that the alpha in the exponential component uh, is now a separate parameter altogether, meaning it's become a third degree of freedom. And this is extremely useful just from a general modeling point of view that these three distributions that we commonly use to empirically model uh, inter-event time distributions and interactions, the log normal Weibull and gamma can be recovered in this way. So when two parameters isn't enough, then the generalized gamma can be useful, not for not just for distinguishing between the various cases, but becoming uh, something from which we might sample and experiment with in its own right. And these quantities can be used to exactly calculate the edge percolation parameter. So CE, this fraction of edges in the non-interacting state. And that's related to the, uh, what we call the residual distribution. So the complementary CDF of the intervent time distribution and looking at its density between zero and our eta parameter, which is a proxy for memory. So to bring this down to earth, uh, we can consider the following example. Imagine we have a mobile phone call network data set where we have time stamped interactions that we can straightforwardly transform to the inter-event time distribution. From that, we can recover the underlying network. And the problem might be, because we've seen that a great litmus test for the outcome of diffusion dynamics is whether a giant temporally connected component exists. The first question in any scenario like that would be, is the network above percolation? Studying the empirical data just using our traditional burstiness parameters, so the mean and standard deviation of the intervent time, means that we can draw no conclusion about what the expected top topological state of the network is. We've seen that that varies significantly depending on our choice of intervent time distributions. But what our results show using our three parameter distribution is that only a single extra measurement of this data set is necessary. So if we measure the skewness, for example, then it might indicate that the network is above percolation and any diffusion process like in our numerical experiments will go through the temporal giant component like wildfire. By extension, if we have two empirical data sets that on the surface seem identical, so same mean and standard deviation, we may have concluded that their dynamics are similar. But if a third measurement shows that its skewness is different to that of the first data set, then perhaps it might be below percolation, meaning the dynamics are extremely slow, relying on these small components to move around the network, mediating the information relatively ineffectively. So to sum up, the goal of the work was to study how burstiness affects the dynamics of diffusion. So it started off as a very theoretical study, but the parts that I presented today with a Monte Carlo experiment component 
And the highlights of these experiments were, sh were to show that even when we're using renewal processes, in other words, throwing away loads of the underlying complexity that leads to bursiness, so any notion of autocorrelation causality, then even then, there's still enough information stored in the intravent time distribution for the bursiness parameter to be ineffective in predicting the dynamical outcomes. So instead of two parameters, so the mean and standard deviation of bursiness, uh, a third parameter is effective in specifying the dynamics. And we've seen that edge, the edge percolation problem provides a great litmus test to the dynamics and the phase separations that we observe. Future work, there are plenty of simplifying assumptions that I made in developing the model. For example, the memory kernel, the structure of the underlying network. Uh, these you can play around with to a great extent without changing any of our conclusions. For example, changing from a uniform memory kernel to say that the influence of a given event drops off smoothly uh, at its own rate over time, rather than having a uniform cutoff. You can vary all that without changing any of the story. Uh, but probably the biggest assumption that we've made besides that is that activity on each edge was uncorrelated. And of course, burstiness is not just by neighbor, but by node. So uh, there may be correlation within edges that, uh, that leads to changes in the dynamical behavior. But we would still be able to use a lot of the same tools. So even in this case, it's likely that uh, the existence of a giant component would be a great indicator that any temporal dynamics is going to be fast. So I'll leave it there. All of this can be found in the following paper that was published in Nature Communications in January. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions or discussions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Samuel. Thank you. Um, so I, yeah, so I opened the floor for the questions. Uh, hopefully there are a few questions from the participants. Any questions? Feel free to activate your microphone. So, in case, uh, just just for, of like, I guess for the potential to warm up, uh, I guess I have a question uh, myself. Um, so, you divided in, uh, you introduced this memory kernel. Um, and then you have this parameter eta for the memory kernel. Um, so uh, is there anything like, is there a distribution of memory kernel? So the, can the kernel have the same complexity that you discuss for psi, I guess, for the for distribution of intertime? So um, is the story about the memory kernel as like potentially as complex uh, um, or, or or not? Is that, that's my question. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And we, we correctly expected this to come up in uh, peer review. And that was one of the first questions. So it's a fairly big simplifying assumption to derive some notion of interaction strength. Uh, and of course, we want to know how our results depend on this. And so one of the first things we did in responding to this in peer review was uh, to let it vary in as many ways as possible. So using various distributions, even in the works I've presented, we've shown that the uh, the magnitude of eta, so the mean uh, memory time, uh, leads to interesting results, but doesn't fundamentally change the story. Uh, and basically, you can choose any distribution you like of memory time for each event, and the story doesn't change. So you still have variation in the phase separation due to our choice of intra-event time distribution. So our conclusions regarding the third parameter, so the skewness, for example, in addition to mean and standard deviation is critical. But besides that, what we generally observed is that by choosing different distributions of memory, all we're really doing is taking the three 
phase transitions in the heat space heat map I showed and changing their angle. And our qualitative story is that we do have three uh, phase transitions for each of the three, uh, one for each of the distributions. So that fundamental picture doesn't change. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, I don't know if there are other questions from the audience, from the participants. No. So I have another question actually. Um, so um, in terms of uh, inference, uh, like learning the model, uh, uh, what I mean is that if you have an empirical data set, like a, a sequence of timestamped uh, links, Mm -hmm. uh, like, is there, yeah, is, is, do you have like a calibration method for, for this model uh, or some kind of benchmark uh, models you can use to, to understand, make sense of the data? You were mentioning the, the momentum, uh, the, moment, the moments, sorry, of the distribution as a way to, uh, to yeah, make sense of the of empirical data. Is there, uh, can you calibrate it more specifically? Yeah. Yeah, so as I mentioned, so inter-event time distributions and fitting them uh, using well-known distributions like the log normal, Vable, these are common, this is a, you can find plenty of papers that do that. The biggest thing that we've introduced is the memory kernel, like in your previous question. And this is something that's latent. So we can't look at, we can't take a data set and say, okay, how, how is, are the participants' memory affecting like their interaction strength. So this is something that we've hypothesized. Uh, in terms of estimating that, it's quite complex, but if you take stochastic processes that do intrinsically use memory, for example, uh, self-exciting point presses like Hawks processes that explicitly take in uh, the history of the time series in order to produce future events, then you can start to calibrate uh, a history dependent model to empirical data. And because Hawks processes do a good job of, a surprisingly good job actually, of recovering intervent time distribution data, then you can't, perhaps can start to estimate the number of events in the past uh, that the process relies on in order to produce the same patterns. So that would be one way of going about uh, studying the role of memory. Uh, but that's uh, that's a complex thing to do in its own right. But that's a good question. It's, it's something we thought about a lot as part of future work. No, thank you very much. You know, I mean, I guess that's the general question with uh, temporal weighted networks uh, where you have, yes, so many uh, parameters to fix. And, and I guess having a good generative model and a good model to learn, it's, it's always kind of a challenge. Um, oh. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't know if there are any questions for the, from the participants at this stage. Uh, last chance. Um, in case, I, I guess, not, there's not a last chance, I guess, uh, because I guess we have your email. So I guess we yeah. can try to contact you there for further questions. But thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it, was a, it was a very interesting uh, seminar for us, uh, specifically, hopefully, also for our YouTube audience. And um, See you soon, hopefully, in a conference, maybe. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's my pleasure. Bye. Thank you.